actually Dr. Quicksall's grad student, so I work with him on all the same things that he works on. I also teach in the lab. Uh, I teach different environmental engineering classes, um, and I work on research that he works on as well. So I'm basically giving a similar presentation to what he would have given you too. So I can tell you from the teaching side and the research side and the student side of what we do here at SMU. Uh, this is us in Taos. Actually, uh, SMU has a campus in Taos, and we were doing um, Alpine Lake sediment coring. We'll talk about later. This is Dr. Quicksall here, and this is me here um, doing our pony up up there, but I kind of got more towards the frog, so I was closer. <laughs> and some of these are undergrads, and some of them are graduate students. Um, so an overview of what I'll tell you about. I'll give you a little bit about my academic background and my uh, work experience background. I have like a very diverse work background, um, and I worked in Australia for four and a half years, so I got my experience over there. Um, I'll tell you, yeah, about my work experience. Um, the SMU in Taos program and uh, what we do there, how we have hands-on learning. Um, and the current research I'm doing at SMU, which I've been working with depleted uranium, removing it from groundwater using fish bones. And I was going to bring you some depleted uranium samples and show you a nice experiment, but maybe risk assessment might not like that. Because I'll just tell you about it so you're not all hiding against the back of the wall. Um, but I do that experiment in my industrial hygiene class. And they're okay with it, they often stand against the back wall as well, but I teach them to reduce their exposures in that way. Um, so a little bit about me, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Architectural Engineering from UT Austin. Um, then I spent four years, four and a half years in Australia, um, working over there as a civil engineer on highways and transportation projects, and I did some light rail. Um, and from there, I was doing structures, I got into civil, and then I got really interested in environmental, so I kind of shifted that way, where you don't really know when you're young exactly what you want to do, then you kind of find your way through that path. Um, I have a master's in sustainability and development from SMU, so I'm really interested in sustainability, and I bring that into my teaching a lot as well. So like, for example, we take a lab visit to the Bush Library, and we look at all the bioswales that clean the water and the sustainable features. Um, so I bring that into my teaching as well. Then my PhD, I'm about two and a half years into my PhD in environmental engineering. Um, so I'm still going to complete that soon, and hopefully I'll work at SMU in the future. But, I mean, I already work here now, but maybe permanently. Um, and so I'm an adjunct instructor. I've taught meteorology, is what I started off teaching. Um, I teach industrial hygiene, which is about workplace hazards. So we learn about noise and radiation and slips, trips, and falls, all the workplace hazards, um, how we protect ourselves from all these different chemicals that are going to injure us, asbestos, all that fun stuff. Um, so we talk about that. I teach intro to civil and environmental engineering right now, and I taught it last semester. Um, and I introduce them to every topic, just a broad touch, and I have guest speakers about transportation, structures, solid waste, wastewater, water quality, um, sustainability. I pull everything in together. So, um, And we are having some high school students come visit us on Monday, so I don't know if that's something that they do. But um, it's a really good introduction to the, the major. And what I teach them is it's so broad. So if you sign up for civil and you don't like one piece, there's always another piece. There's so many other pieces that come together. So like me, you could just find your way into another field from where you started. Um, and I've been a teaching assistant for everything under the sun, so air quality, microbiology. Um, so I've had a lot of experience teaching here at SMU. I've been here a long time. Um, so a little bit about my work experience. I started working in a really interesting location. So I was actually in the Gold Coast of Australia, just kind of near Brisbane. Um, in New South Wales and Queensland. And so it goes on the metric system, which was really interesting. So I got really involved with metrics, and I came back here, and I'm working with feet and inches, and it's, you know, a little confusing. Um, we were working in this environment that was, like, super developed, right against all these pristine natural systems. So we were trying to not impact the systems while also building what we need to build and dealing with congestion and everything in this setting. Um, and they had wetlands, rainforest, I did a lot of monitoring in the rainforest, um, beaches, mountains, and a lot of wildlife that we did protection for. So here I started looking into jobs, and they say, oh, we deal with the bugs and the bunnies, but there they deal with the kangaroos and the echidnas. So um, they have all the different animals there that they deal with. These are all pictures that I took as well. Um, so I'm just going to explain one project that really shifted me from where I was to where I have gone, um, which is the Tugan Bypass. So it was my first job basically out of college. They put me on this construction site with 300 construction people um, doing structures. And I was looking at the bridges and the tunnels there. Um, and this was an interesting project because 
Queensland has a highway, the M1. New South Wales has a highway, the M1. But when you reach the border, you have to get off the highway, go along the beach and through the town and get back on the highway. So we wanted to build this link between these things so this poor little Tugan town didn't keep getting so much congestion. So they finally came together to build this highway project. Um, so a little bit about it, you can read it was $543 million project, so it's gigantic. Um, it had six bridges, all these interchanges, signs and landmarks. <coughs> um, it was underneath, they had a tunnel underneath an airport runway, so it was really interesting loading um, across this tunnel. You had to deal with random airplanes coming across it. Um, they had tons of earthwork, concrete, and 600 jobs, so there was always a, a good time there, you know, working with other engineers in other fields. You know, some people I worked with there. Um, some examples of, like, tunnel design, the kind of engineering that you use in tunnel design, mm -hmm. how that links together. Um, we had airplane loads, obviously, from the top going on the soil pressure that was trying to maintain it. We wanted a 100-year design life, so we wanted it to not fail. But now what we're finding in, um, in the U.S. is our civil engineering lifespans are coming up, like the 50-year design life. So mm -hmm. there's so many jobs for civil engineers because we need to replace all these things that we've given this design life to that are coming out. Um, and we wanted it to be fire resistant. So they had like all these sensor systems in there to see if there was fires, um, make sure there weren't explosive gases. Um, all this intelligent transport systems in this tunnel as well. They had barricades that were supposed to go down if you were an overhyped vehicle, but they definitely had some overhyped vehicles run in and get stuck. So it doesn't work all the time, but they were working on it. Um, so pressures were really interesting around it, and uh, the hydrostatic pressures. So they actually ended up dewatering before they built the tunnel, um, and then putting the water back in, which is why I got involved with groundwater monitoring to make sure we weren't messing up the environment in that way. Um, then the buoyancy forces of the tunnel wanting to just pop up. I learned about that kind of stuff and all the calculations that go along with it. Um, and traffic incident impacts, so that's a big one we talked about in my class about bridges. If someone hits the bridge, then you've got to deal with that kind of loading um, and dewatering. Um, we had six bridges, so for example, this is Mr. Billabong who got his own bridge, the guy that developed Billabong, mm -hmm. um, because they had to cut out his driveway mm -hmm. to build this tunnel, so, or this highway. Um, they had uh, concrete T-beam bridges, pedestrian paths, and uh, lots of different deck spans of different kinds. But what I found really interesting about this project, and I wasn't even intending to find this interesting, um, was what they did with their wildlife. So, Someone found these tiny frogs on the site, the Wallum sedge frog, and it is an endangered frog. And they said, no building this project unless you look at these frogs. So what they did was they built frog ponds, they built frog culverts under the highway, they did frog monitoring, so I've been out at midnight listening to the frogs rivet and counting how many frogs are mating back and forth with each other. And if they're connecting, because you can't split up this population, you have one side evolving and one side evolving the other way, and the frogs are really important, it turns out, um, for the ecosystem. So that became a huge deal. This project, they spent a third of the budget on environmental stuff as well. Um, they had the planigales and the long-nosed potaroos were some of the animals on site. Um, so we actually did monitoring. We had culverts. We did monitoring with little pieces of tape on the culverts to see if their hair would get taken up, to see if they were using them, um, and make sure that we cared about these animals and the system. Um, we did compensatory habitats, so I would go check nest boxes and see what kind of squirrel gliders were living in there um, and how we were doing with that. And compensatory habitat, so they went and bought 76 acres somewhere else to rebuild land, and they built in all these different um, places for animals to live, so they really wanted that to happen. <coughs> also, um, I'll show you in a second, actually. So um, they had plants. They had all these threatened plants and wildlife as well, and they had this whole rainforest habitat down here they didn't want to impact, so they actually built a bridge over that area and left it down there and put walking paths. Um, they relocated these swamp orchids and to top secret locations. <laughs> they moved to mangroves, you know, somewhere else. It's kind of the things we just aren't really doing right now, but we're trying to get into in the U.S., but they were really doing it there. Um, and landscaping of 330,000 plants. And, uh, yeah, they built the bridge over it. Water quality, I got involved with groundwater monitoring, and that's where I started getting interested in water quality. Um, so we were testing water to make sure that there wasn't, um, it wasn't acidic and a low pH, and that would have harmed the uh, system there. Um, so they did all this 
cross drains and the tunnel and surface water monitoring, I like got in the overalls and go in the water and take water samples and bring them back and acidify them. Um, and so uh, all that kind of <coughs> stuff got me really interested in it. And the drainage design. Um, another project, just kind of skimming through how I could combine structural and environmental, they started realizing I was really into these kind of projects that were environmental related. Um, so they put me on this fish ladder project. So fish, when they hit a dam or a weir, they try to get up and they can't and it causes problems with their spawning. Um, so there was this non-functional fish ladder we had to go in and design <coughs> so that the fish could jump from piece to piece and get up the weir there. So that was an interesting project that I worked on. Just, I mean, if someone was interested in structures and engineering and environmental, they could combine that stuff together. And actually in Canada, they do fish elevators a lot. And they get the fish inside the elevator, lift up, and let the fish off at the top. So that's really cool. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that as much here. But yeah, no, seriously, they lure them in. Sometimes they lure them into trucks. They drive them upstream, and they let them out of the trucks, too. But that's not as fancy as the fish elevator. So. But this is just the basic thing with any dam that you have to do. So I got really into this kind of calculation velocity that it had to go around the to get the fish swimming up so that they would you know be attracted to the upstream and everything. Very cool. Uh, I talked with an expert. I worked with an expert. Um, another way I combined structural and environmental, um, they found these koalas on this, this motorway that they were um, doing up. And when you find koalas, it's a big deal. So if you do a fauna spotting, which I did some fauna spotting, you find koalas, you got to do something about it. Um, so they asked me to do this report and design maybe some sort of koala passage option or signs or something we could do. Um, and what actually became of this, uh, this is my picture as well, um, what actually became of this is I was also the signs and line markings person. So we had gantries of signs that went across the road. So I actually said, what if this was also a koala bridge? You know, what if we somehow designed it so it's already there? but we use it in an environmental way as well. So you can kind of combine the different ideas with that. And so I don't think they ever did it, but I thought it was very good idea. They thought it was cool. And it, it let them see that they were doing something. So report writing can be fun. I had a lot of fun writing that before. Um, the, then I got on the Gold Coast Light Rail. I was on construction sites. Um, and I did spotter catcher. So as they tear down trees, you have someone has to run in and save all the possums and everything that comes out of the tree. So I put them in pillowcases and relocate them. I relocate a lot of birds. I was a bird wildlife carer, so I always care for birds anyway. Um, but I got really involved with that. And then I wrote a million different reports. Go visit the site, look at the impacts that your construction project is going to have write a report for the government saying what they have to do to not impact with their road. Or redesign your road to go around this tree that I think is a really great tree. So um, you kind of have that say as an environmental person. So I, kinda, I was on both sides. I would also like supervise piling and different concrete stuff as well. So, I um, so now tying into SMU, I don't know how much time I have. Um, I will just go and explain some of these pictures and how they fit together with what I've done at SMU. Um, so the first thing I got involved with was, let's pull these pictures up, um, SMU and Taos. So Dr. Quicksall teaches a class there, Soil and Water um, Field Methods for Sampling. And it's really great to like get outdoors and get your hands dirty with what you're doing. Um, but he actually had to go to the Congo suddenly two years ago, so I ended up teaching his class for him. Um, but what we did is we'd go out and like look at geology, geological features, and take soil cores. Um, the, Students would stand in the water and take, you know, measurements of the different streams and erosion based on the total suspended solids that we could analyze. Um, so they got their hands really wet with that. We did a lot of hot springs sampling, which we enjoyed a lot. I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, and we took lots of hikes to different lakes where we could take samples. Um, so it was like a non-traditional classroom setting. So this is Tara. Tara now works with me in the lab. Um, so she's really into this kind of stuff, but she's taking soil samples for the first time, learning how to do that. Um, this is Rachel and Lizzie. They're learning how freezing this lake is, um, and then they're taking soil samples, which you're supposed to get in with a mallet, and when you're malleting inside something like this, it's not the best for you. Um, but she's very cold. She's actually screaming in a video of this as well. So getting in there, getting yourself dirty. There's a lot of like nature preserves around here. People can go and do this too, you know, do this kind of sampling. Um, this is them back in the lab with Dr. Cooksall, um, learning to test everything, just with simple little kits and tests um, that they can analyze their water and their soil and classify it. 
Um, this is Dr. Cooksall explaining about geology. And this is Rachel enjoying the snow uh, when we were up in the mountains as well. So they have a good time and they learn a lot as well. Um, another assignment we did with them out there that someone could do around here, uh, <coughs> we gave them handheld GPSs and we had them GPS a disc golf course on campus, which was a huge disc golf course, all in the woods and everything. Um, so they'd go and find the basket and they'd go and find the tee and they'd mark it on their handheld GPS. And then we used ArcGIS Online, which you can get a free 30-day trial. Um, and we had them make these maps of the tee to the basket and they could find the distance to each piece and they could kind of do little calculations based on that and learn how to make maps. Because maps are really up and coming in this GIS, Geographical Information Systems. Everybody wants everyone to have it, so it's a really big skill. They did the bridges too. Um, we did some hot spring sampling. This is Noemi, she's taking hot spring samples. Um, this is Lizzie with uh, Dr. Quixel's Congolese child that I'm obsessed with. Um, she's helping babysit while the others sample. Uh, this is some grad students doing some work. So they're looking at, there's a lot of like arsenic dissolved in these things. There's a lot of interesting metals. So we actually went to Ojo Caliente and sampled from their 10 hot springs there that are all little arsenic springs and the soda springs. And they all have their names. So we were like seeing if they live up to their names. So Mal still has, yeah, we have an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer that we run these things on and we see what metals are in them from that. So she's still willing to run those. Um, I'm really into sediment sampling at Alpine Lakes, so that's kind of my new direction that I'm going. Um, so when I was in Taos, I hiked to eight different Alpine Lakes, about 30 or 40 miles. Um, took these soil cores and water samples. Um, and then I want to go back and take tree ring cores and analyze the tree ring cores and count the rings and digest those for metals and compare it to the metals in the lake and see from atmospheric pollution that might have fallen on that lake because that's the only source of contamination it can have, how that's affecting the plants around it. So that's kind of something that I'm interested in and in recreating paleo environmental settings from back in the day, depending on how far your core goes down, like an inch could be, you know, 10 years, this could be 100 years, you could go down to like a thousand years if you wanted to. So I'm really interested in that. I proposed a project to the EPA, but they said it was good, but not very good. So they didn't approve it, but I'm still going to do it anyway. Um, we did some camping on that trip, which you guys could take your kids camping and take them uh, soil sampling and water sampling. Um, this is Lizzie filtering some water, and um, this is Williams Lake with some of the students. Um, now, quickly just getting into one of my major projects that I worked on that's kind of separated from this as well. Um, I worked on removing uranium using hydroxyapatite, which we derived from a fishbone material. So this is going to get a little chemistry based, so um, don't be scared, but uh, it's very fun. It's like detective work to figure out what was going on in our experiment. So we were given this um, super fun site. So super fun is when something is really hazardous and toxic, um, and it gets designated super fun. They put uh, money towards cleaning it up. So there was a site in Boston near Walden Pond, basically. So it's like in the forest of Boston. Um, and these people used to manufacture um, depleted uranium bullets. And so they would use nitric acid to kind of clean off the outside. They'd throw it in a sediment pond, 50s through the 80s, because that's what we do. Um, and so they'd throw it in this sediment pond here. Oh, oh geez. Sorry, wrong way. Um, OK, so it was designated as a super fun site because it turned out the soil was really contaminated. But they removed the soil, some of it, but it's a gigantic like acres and acres of land so they can't remove all the soil and the groundwater is really contaminated and it's migrating so that's an issue that you don't want to deal with especially because these people drink groundwater so um, so what we wanted to do was find a solution to clean up this water so um, one of the ways environmental engineers do this a lot is something called a permeable reactive barrier so you put whatever it is usually iron a lot of times or something carbonaceous and the water flows through it and it attracts the little ions, and it takes the metals out, and then the water's clean that comes out beyond it. But we wanted to find something that would work with uranium for this site, for in particular. So that's just kind of an idea. We wanted to reduce the concentration so that the water would be OK. Find a long-term solution, get the maximum environmental benefit that we could, um, and continue to remove the depleted uranium. So there was a constant source, so we wanted to make sure we were always removing it. Okay, so. We've been working with this hydroxy.
Gramsci Appetite, other grad students have worked on this for a while. Um, but there's a thing called Appetite 2 that they take a waste product, which is catfish bones, um, stuff that they weren't using anyways, they're just going to throw in the landfill. They crush it up, and it's actually known to be really good at removing heavy metals from solution. So we know it works with zinc and lead, these other heavy metals. Um, but no one had used it yet for uranium, <coughs> so we thought, there's one guy that had done a little lab experiment with uranium, and he thought it might work, and uh, the chemistry of like modeling it said it would work, but no one had done it. So this is a microscope image I took here of the appetite surface as well, and how smooth it is. Do I need to get going? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so we worked with this consulting firm in Boston. Um, they took this appetite, too, and they were at the site, and they had a shed, and they put columns of this appetite, too, in the shed, and they pumped groundwater through it, and then they also put columns in the ground, and the groundwater went through passively, so we did passive versus active columns. Um, then the DU-loaded um, columns were shipped to SMU for solids analysis, so... They didn't know at the time they probably shouldn't ship this entire thing at once, but when I shipped it back, I had to do it in like six different coolers because of the radiation. Um, but it's really not that bad. I was going to bring you guys an example. <laughs> I was told maybe risk management, but I don't appreciate that. So I can just tell you what we do in the lab with the, because I use it for teaching now too, some of the samples. Um, and then we wanted to know what was forming in the column. So they tested what went in and they tested what went out, and they knew the uranium was gone from the water. So, okay, it's in the column. But how is it in a column? Is it just absorbed to the surface and it's going to come free again? Is it something stable? Um, so we wanted to know what's going on in there. So that's why I said, SMU, figure this out. What's going on? This is the path of column, which didn't have much uranium, which is very disappointing. But that's just because it, so this signifies like, you know, a year of doing it. This signifies like 10 years of doing it because you're actively pumping it. So that it makes up for the time. Um, so I use this thing a lot called x-ray diffraction. Um, so what it does is it shoots x-rays from a copper tube at your sample that's powdered um, and it reflects back in certain ways. And so we get intensities at different angles um, based on the molecular structure and the distance between bonds in the, um, in the solid. So that tells us how crystalline something is and what it is. So it's really useful. Um, so when I did just appetite, it looks like this is what I get out. And there's software that matches this. So the blue lines is the appetite. But when I did the active columns, it looked like this, which is like completely different. So I mean, I knew something was going on. I mean, it actually was really exciting. It matched this mineral, Trinicabite, which is a really cool mineral because it's really stable. It's stable for like 10,000 years, they think, because it's up near volcanoes and it's just been stable forever. Um, so it's actually, once it gets in the Trinicabite, it's the favor to stay in the Trinicabite. So it's not likely to come out again. Okay. So a little idea of how this would happen chemically. Um, the appetite would see the uranium and say, oh, well, there's uranium. I'd really prefer to be with the uranium. Um, so it releases the calcium, and it forms this mineral trinicobite. So it's a phosphate mineral, just loses the calcium, gains the uranium, and forms something new from that. Okay. So we needed more clues than just this, because you can't just say, well, this says it's you know, trinicobite. So you wanted to kind of verify this and make sure. Um, so I did this scanning electron microscopy. Where I took an image of my surface, and with this SEM, you can see what elements are present at the image. So, like, you can pinpoint a spot in your image, and it'll say uranium's here, phosphorus is here, um, calcium's here. So, I noticed this cauliflower like formation that kind of zoomed in on there. And it looks different, so you can see what the appetite is all smooth, but this is kind of crazy looking. Um, so, I could tell from my mapping, I did this big map, it takes like an hour. Um, phosphorus was present where the red is. Uranium was definitely present at that site. Um, but it's hard to see in this room, but calcium, there's no blue there at all. So calcium is gone at that local site where the cauliflower-like thing was. So that's a good indication to me, since calcium is absent, of this trinicobite formation, because you can see the calcium's gone. The phosphorus is there, and physically it looks different. So it's very crystalline. So I did a lot of other experiments too, but I kind of left that up for brevity here. Um, but the, the paper's online, I think, in the EPA site. Um, so we found out appetite was definitely forming trinicobite. Um, so this is what appetite looks like. This is one of the columns, the active columns. This is the inlet over here. And this is what trinicobite looks like. So you can see definitely you're getting something forming in that column. Okay. 
And so it would be an ideal solution to remediate the site, which the company we were working with in Boston was like over the moon about. So um, they were very excited. So then to kind of follow up, the EPA did um, issue a proposed plan based on all these findings. We did all these reports and everything. Um, and so they did, I just looked it up, they did an official record of decision September 28th, 2015. So this is now set in stone. They did the comment period. And they proposed plan is full in situ stabilization of DU contaminated soils in the holding basin using Appetite 2 injection. So based on this research that we did, they were going to go and clean up this gigantic site with it. Um, and they spent so much money on this cleanup. And they finally, there's a lot of other things at this site too that are PCBs, which are really toxic as well. But they're doing other stuff for those. But this is for the uranium part of it. And it's not the radiation they're concerned about, it's the toxicity. So uranium is extremely toxic. Um, so that's a problem. Um, so I took out. I was going to show you guys some of the experiments I do in my class, but again, the radioactive materials would not have been welcome here. Um, but I do show them the uh, inverse square law of like light, sound, radiation, how it comes out, and it one over the square of the distance is how your intensity decreases. So like with photography and everything, too, with lighting, you kind of have to think about that. But with radiation, it's the same. And so I have my kids use Geiger counters and get different distances away from the radioactive materials and read the intensities and calculate what that would 